Well, I was out for the last hour. Well, I didn't have this on my calendar. Hands down, Reese's Pieces, Peanut Butter Cups. 
<laughs> Is anybody Italian? <laughs> yeah, I really both. <laughs> I still crafted under the eyes of Walt and they can't get away from you. <laughs> you can better job that. Uh, my name is Joy, I'm an Agora student. I love Kit Kat. It's going to be down to Reese's and Kit Kat. Three, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Jenny and I'm also a student from the University of Michigan. Do you have a favorite candy? Um, <laughs> I'm Julie Moore with City of Shorewood, and I guess I would go pierce some salt in that roll, but nobody gives them out anymore because of the peanut allergy. So I just steal them. I'm Allie Hillstrom. I'm with the City of Inverse Girls High School, and I have to go with Kit Kat also. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brian Ross from the Great Plains Institute, and can I go with candy corn? Oh, no. Get out. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to go with Reese's or, or Twix or no, no. <laughs> <laughs> What about those pixie sticks with weird, like, uh, sugar? Great sugar. sugar. Yeah. 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 I'm the Minnesota City. Just a break from the norm. I like those. Apple suckers that are dipped in the caramel, and it's the only hard candy I ever eat throughout the course of the year. Something about that thing. <laughs> you like real caramel apples? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Nick. I'm here at the U of M. I also work for the City of Medina. And guess what? Uh, my name is Jimmy Sun. Uh, I'm a student from the University of Minnesota. Uh, I'm an English student, big still. Uh, 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 my name is Ting Bak from China, the New Orleans based student, and we are all classmates, so we come here to finish our project about the energy. Nice. So, yeah, so we have, you noticed maybe, a lot of University of Minnesota students, so it's really cool to have you guys here and as part of your project. Yeah. yeah my name is Eric, and uh, I'm from the University of Minnesota. Uh, my favorite candy is.
Alexis Trashenet from CERC will be talking about savings bonds and drops, and um, Kate Lindstrom will be talking about solar financing. Um, so let's go ahead and get into it. We have a lot of material. Um, do you, is there a second slide? I don't have the clicker. Um, so today we're more or less covering best practice 6.5 which talks about energy and action planning. Um, so we have some resources and tools that we've developed to help cities think through that, and it's especially important for those cities who are going through their comprehensive planning update um, process right now so that they can start thinking about what do they need to include, um, what do they want to include, what kind of goals do they want to set, um, and, and what resources are available to folks to do that. Um, so I won't get into this in too much detail, um, uh, at all, really. I'm just going to kind of go into the logo hub thing. So I don't know, Brian or Becky, but for both of you want to start. Let's go to that. Hello, everyone. Brian Ross, Great Plains Institute, and I'm going to be talking about logo pep along with Becky Alexander. Um, and this is a reprisal of our uh, presentation we made before the American Planning Association, but we have to squeeze it into more or fewer minutes, and so I'm going to talk really fast. <laughs> um, but uh, this is about the, the local FAP program, um, but we're, um, the, and the tools that are provided through that. However, the, kind of the general concept here is what, what is energy planning, why do cities do it, how do you do it, and what difference is it going to make? Um, and really, understanding what energy planning is at the local level is, is a little bit um, difficult for some local governments because they aren't used to dealing with energy. They don't think about energy as a local issue. It's a state issue, it's a utility issue, it does, somebody else does it, um, but now we're, we're starting to see a transformation in the market um, and, and, and cities and local governments need to start thinking about energy as a development issue, a local development issue with local resources that are underutilized and that, need to, and that have benefit to the community. And, and that's, they need to plan for them in the same way that they plan for other kinds of development resources. Cities routinely do things like uh, uh, plan for how they use vacant land for housing, how they protect natural resources in their community, how they use uh, other kinds of economic resources like aggregates in their community. Um, those are things that are routine in planning and cities have lots of tools to use to, to address those and they need to start thinking about energy in the same way. So uh, the other thing, the reason that this is very important is because energy markets are changing and local energy resources are, have become valuable in a way that it didn't used to be. Uh, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time, and, um, and, and it's, uh, we used to have to try to convince people that, 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 that there was a market for any of these things. Now it's easy. People are instead, you know, they're seeing uh, their community members come to them and say, I want to develop my solar resources. I want to put up a wind turbine. I want to do these other things. How do we go about doing that? And, and a lot of times local governments are not prepared. But you need to think about these things and develop an, as a, an energy plan for your community in the same way that you would other kinds of plans, which really means identifying your existing conditions, kind of where you're at now, um, identifying your desired conditions or where you want to be in the future um, with these resources and with development. And then the third step is the strategies of how we get from where we are now to where we want to be. That's a plan, you know, that's kind of what all plans are about. And an energy plan is the same thing as other kinds uh, of plans. So um, the third thing to keep in mind here is that, that we talk about our energy goals at the state level or the federal level, kind of climate goals, things like that. And what is often missed in those big picture discussions when you hear it, you know, at the, at the legislatures in our state and in our, in our federal government is that the, there's a local element to this that is critical. Local governments are a critical partner in addressing and meeting our, our national and our state and our world energy goals. Most of the energy used in the United States is used in, in, inside urban areas. And where the energy is used, that's where the money is spent and that's where the emissions uh, are, are ultimately coming from. So if we're not addressing these big picture goals at the local level, we're not going to be getting to our goals. And the, mo the kind of second part of that, illustrated by this chart, in case you can actually see it, um, is that most of the cities that we need to talk about are not the big cities. We tend to think of 
uh, the, the solution is going to be if Minneapolis and St. Paul can do this and then we're set and then everything is settled. No. Most people, most energy use, most economic activity happens in smaller cities. And if we're not addressing smaller cities in terms of planning for these resources to be developed in a way that is, is beneficial to our, to our national and our state goals for climate change, we're again not going to be achieving them. We will fail. So very critical in every state throughout the Midwest, this chart shows, most of the people live in cities that are not among the top 10 size cities in the state. So you would think that that wouldn't be true, but most of the cities in, most of the people in Minnesota live in urban areas that are not the top 10 population. Um, so the one thing to take out of this, and I can stop talking after this slide, um, <laughs> is that local energy resources are economically competitive today. And because they're economically competitive today, people are going to want to develop them, and communities determine how that happens. The local zoning, the local plans, the local regulation occur determines how that's going to happen, and state and national goals will be implemented locally. Local energy resources are, are clean energy resources, and that's going to have to happen with the cooperation of local government. So then we have our local pep kind of framework that we've developed, and we're, we have this set up in a large way around some of the, um, uh, the, the workbook and the energy planning guide that we've created. But the first step, as I said, in energy planning is to identify existing conditions um, in your community about what you have, how you use energy, what energy resources you have, and what existing strategies you have in place. And that's kind of what these three things here show, an energy use profile, um, an assessment of clean energy resources in the various buckets that we have that I'll go over in a minute, and the inventory of programs, what, you, what, what are the strategies you already have in place um, in order to reap the benefits of the, your, your clean energy resources. And that first step in the process really is an understanding that energy use profile, um, and that is uh, how is energy used in your community already, and you can see this kind of generalized graph that we included in the guide that shows a community where 34% of the energy is in transportation, 38% is in commercial industrial use, 27% in uh, residential use, and about 1% uh, in city operations. And this is one of those things that's very important. Local governments, when they talk about energy, they tend to focus on their city operations. They say, we will need to make sure that we're a leader by putting solar panels on our city hall and making our public works facility energy efficient, and that's great stuff and cities need to be leaders in that. However, in terms of affecting your community's energy goals, it's 1% of your energy use. Maybe 2%, depends on the community. Really big communities, we see 3%. But that's, you can kind of see, if you're not affecting what's happening in the private sector, you're not going to achieve any goals. And that's, and, and, and the second thing about this is that the people, cities are almost always surprised in their energy use profile of the size of the commercial industrial energy use in their community. This is uh, fairly routine. There are a few communities, or we have a few bedroom <coughs> communities that are primarily residential, but most cities are primarily commercial industrial. And so you need to not only think about where your energy is being used, but you need to think about how are you going to get to your commercial industrial sector to convince them to cooperate with you in terms of achieving your energy goals. So that's why it's critically important to kind of do that assessment. Um, we have a... Um, a, uh, in the regional indicators, a database of communities where we've done these regional assessments or done these citywide assessments of energy. You can kind of see a list down here, and this is a, a demonstration, this active um, slide here, of the, 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 the data sets that are already in the regional indicators, and we have, I think, 27 cities now that are in, in this, and we hope to, by the end, by March, by spring, by spring of 2018 to have something like 70 or 75. 99. 99. Okay. Nine out of 100. 99. <laughs> oh my gosh. Really? Yeah. So, so the, the kind of kind of data you're seeing down here in the demonstration of the different ways that you can assess this by BTU, by carbon, by dollars, uh, by city, by different types of you know commercial industrial or by residential, by component. All this stuff is already embedded in here um, and is a, is available to all these cities for their use. And we've been developing some existing conditions reports um, for 
some of these cities in order to integrate them into their comprehensive planning work. So, um, so that's kind of the existing conditions and understanding what your energy use is in your community. The second piece of existing conditions is understanding what kind of resources you have in your community, clean energy resources you have in your community, and we put them into these four buckets, solar, wind, biofuels, and efficiency. Um, and these, each one of these has economic value. Each one of these are things that are in, inherently at the local level um, and that local governments need to address in their plans as resources, just like they would any other kind of resource. So what is, what are these four resources? Um, efficiency. Um, if people say, oh, I know what efficiency is. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's light bulbs, right? It's efficient light bulbs. And you're right, it is efficient light bulbs, but it's a lot of other things as well. And building energy efficiency overall is a really critical thing to kind of understand and get to. Um, we, have, we have some great tools, and Becky, I can't remember if you're going to go into the SB20 area. Okay, um, in this presentation. Uh, we have some great tools to, um, to address, uh, how do you address building energy efficiency in, in a meaningful and cost-effective and aggressive way. And the important thing here on efficiency is that it is cost-effective. This, this is not a thing we have to wait for, uh, some kind of transformation in technology in order to get to it. The building code is not enough. The building code leaves dollars on the table even though people, the, uh, the building community may tell you that it's very aggressive. There's always a lot of opportunities, probably, you know, 40 or 50 percent of the cost-effective opportunities are not even touched by the building code. Transportation energy efficiency is another thing. We talk about buildings a lot, however, transportation is a critical element of your pie. And understanding what your energy efficiency options are for transportation in your community, things like hybrid vehicles, things like um, right-sizing vehicles, things like land use decisions that allow mode shift, that allow us to get out of our cars and get into bicycles and walk um, and onto transit. Those are energy efficiency measures. And we, if we think about them, it falls into this. Other things are like combined heat and power, um, something that a lot of communities don't think about. The opportunities to do combined heat and power, that's where you generate both heat and electricity in the same operation. It, it, it has dramatically increases the, the effectiveness of the energy use and almost every community that has any kind of an institution in it or any kind of an industrial facility in it um, uh, or any kind of a large commercial operation has opportunities to do combined heat and power and it's one of the most dramatically underused efficiency opportunities in our country. Um, so other kinds of resources that we have in our communities. Solar, everybody kind of understands what solar is, right? We have these sun, sunshines on us every day, free fuel delivered every day, falls on a solar panel, electricity comes out, it's a miracle. And, and we, we, um, we, we, and we have, it is our, in fact, our most abundant um, clean energy resource in our state, in fact, in our nation. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of tools available to communities to help understand the Metropolitan Council, for anybody who's in the Metropolitan area, um, has calculated um, what the solar energy resource is for every single community in, in the metropolitan area. You can get a map that looks kind of like this. This is actually for the city of St. Cloud because we've done some additional cities in greater Minnesota. Um, but uh, it is available to you. You can understand what your resource is. And what we've discovered generally with the solar resource is that just the solar resource that falls on rooftops in your, in your cities is going to be enough to meet something of something approximating 40% of the total electric use in your community. That's the size of the resource and the effectiveness of that resource, and that's just the economic resource under current conditions. So it's a it is a huge resource, and it's something that people will want to take advantage of because it's now a cost-effective resource too. Wind energy resources is something that again we is our most utilized renewable energy resource. It is a little bit more limited um, in terms of who's has it. Um, unlike solar, which is going to be in every community, wind will not be in every community. Um, but it, there, it's important to kind of assess your wind resource, even if it's to the point, uh, just to the point of knowing that you don't have one. Because uh, this is something we do find with communities where uh, they, they, they talk about how do we enable wind energy resources. They have people in their community coming to this planning commission and saying, we want to put up a wind turbine, and kind of understanding when that makes sense and when that doesn't make sense is an important decision in the community because the last thing those of us who are being advocates for renewable energy want to have is putting up what we call a wind sculpture in the backyard, right? Something that looks like a turbine, 
but it doesn't do anything. Feels like a turbine. Yeah. <laughs> Feels like a turbine. Is it a turbine? Not really. No. If there's no wind resource, it does. It's like putting up an oil. Say, if I just put up an oil derrick in my backyard, I'll get some oil out of it. No, you won't. There's no resource there. Understand that kind of in your community where there is a resource and where there's not is very critical. Um, rural, re rural communities will t almost always have a wind resource in Minnesota. Um, urban communities, <coughs> at least in the metropolitan area, have a very limited resource. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Biomass. This is one that, that a lot of people look at me askance when I talk about, but in fact, almost every community in Minnesota has a biomass resource. Unlike wind, almost every community has a biomass resource. We they tend to think of biomass as being an agricultural product, and it is. You know, when we turn agricultural products or agricultural waste into things like ethanol or into biodiesel, those kinds of, that, that is in fact biomass. But also we have some, several examples of great biomass resources in our metropolitan area here that are cost effective and have been in place for a long time. We have District Energy St. Paul, not far from here, um, right in smack in the heart of downtown uh, St. Paul that provides both electricity and heat through wood waste. So they're, they're collecting tree trimmings and things like that, and it fuels their power plant and their heat generation. And it's, and it's a cost-effective operation, and it's a great example. The uh, Coda Energy Plant down in, in Shakopee, along with the Midwaukee and Sioux um, community, uh, it burns uh, um, shells from raw malting, um, as well as wood waste from several different suburban communities who deliver it there. Um, solid waste, kind of remnants of things we can't recycle. Um, Hen uh, I'm sorry, Ramsey and Washington County have uh, a, a operate a facility now that they just purchased. They operate it together to take all of this, that, that extra solid waste, turn it into a fuel that's then burned into an XL energy power plant. These are biomass resources. Uh, most of it goes to waste. Um, it is an opportunity. Um, so those are the four resources, and that's the existing conditions. And now I just want to talk briefly about now that you know where you are, where do you want to go? Uh, so that's the second part of the planning process, and it's setting desired conditions. And one thing we've done in the Logo Pep um, project is that we've been helped identify what desired conditions look like. Because when someone says, well, what, what is a solar goal? What is a biomass goal? What is a energy reduction goal? We've actually identified some sample goals, and, and, um, and they can, you know, in a plan, you talk about goals and policies and strategies, and a lot of these things we've identified could be adapted to any one of those higher pieces of the hierarchy, but we call them all goals for simplicity's sake. Um, we have um, identified kind of the big picture goals, kind of community-wide. How do you set up an energy goal for your community? Well, let's, let's talk about reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to meet the state's 20, uh, 2007 Next Generation Energy Act goals. 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050. That's the simplest thing a community can do. And here's the, you know, I'll, I'll, my call to action, start it right now. Every community in this room should be putting in their comprehensive plan something that is akin to saying we endorse the state's Next Generation Energy Act standard 80% by 2050 because you are then working in collaboration with the state and with your utility and with the federal government all to achieve that goal. It's not upon you, it is a partnership that you're entering into, and it makes a lot of sense, and it is achievable. <coughs> so um, we have this document, it's about a four-page document on the local PEP webpage on the energy planning tab um, that, that provides uh, four, you know, four pages of examples of goals in different kinds of configurations. We have examples of solar, wind, biomass, efficiency goals. We have some technology goals around things like electric vehicles that you can look at. Um, and, uh, and also some goals that address things, co-benefit for the community, like not only do we want to reduce energy, but we want to make sure that low-income people have access to it. Not only do we want to reduce energy, but we want to make sure that other environmental benefits are captured in that process, in the development process of local energy resources. Um, and the Metropolitan Council um, has also de de developed some of this for the comprehensive planning effort. Um, specifically, the solar energy goal is the one goal in the comprehensive plan that is required, and if there's any uh, community in this room that hasn't yet addressed their solar energy goal in their plan, just be cognizant of the fact that the standard for what you need to do in your comprehensive plan around <laughs> solar energy has changed from the last round. Um, you, it, 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 10 years ago, when we did comprehensive planning, solar energy was 
was just a uh, it was just a gleam, right? I mean, it was it was a wish. Uh, we, there really wasn't a market for it. Uh, today, there's a robust market for it, and that as a consequence, it's much more important that communities plan for it in a meaningful way. And the council standards for what you need to put in your comprehensive plan have changed, and you need to make sure that you address those. So, one of the tools we have here is that that I'm going to let Becky talk about is this fascinating wedge diagram tool, and this is the part that everybody really wants to see and not listen to me. <laughs> so I'm going to hand it over to Becky. Switch over to a live version on the website so we can actually see this in action. So Brian showed the screenshot of that regional indicators website where the baseline information, existing conditions information, is available for Minnesota communities. This is on that energy planning tab where you can find the other resources that Brian mentioned. And then specifically, here's the wedge tool. So this tool is um, basically showing existing conditions that Brian talked about, existing conditions projected out into the future, looking at an end year of 2040 here, which is the comprehensive planning timeline, and then desired conditions, and then how do we close the gap between business as usual and where we actually want to be going. So there are a couple of elements to this. I'll just say um, in terms of selecting the city, all cities that have data available through the Regional Indicators Initiative is, are currently able to look at the wedge tool for their specific city. Um, we're looking at St. Louis Park here, we've been helping St. Louis Park develop a climate action plan, so I can use some kind of real world examples for how that city used the wedge diagram tool to help draft their climate action plan. Um, in terms of where the data is coming from, the historic data from the regional indicators initiative is collected from electric utilities, natural gas utilities, emissions, and translated into greenhouse gas emissions using utility specific emissions factors. I also want to point out, Brian has been talking about energy planning comprehensively, so not just building energy, electricity, and natural gas, but also travel energy. This tool right now is just looking at building energy and associated greenhouse gas emissions. So for communities to do a comprehensive climate action plan or greenhouse gas assessment, they would need to also consider those other sources, like vehicle travel, waste, wastewater, air travel, those types of things. But as you also saw from the graph that Brian showed, building energy is about two-thirds of the total pie for most of the cities in our um, study. So it is the, the main piece that we thought would be good to start with. Um, the business as usual trajectory for each city is created using the um, forecasted population and jobs. And for Met Council cities, this is done by the Met Council for Cities in Greater Minnesota is done by the State Demography Center. And so basically this is important to understand because it means we've, we're applying historic energy use to future people and buildings, saying that a building in 2040 will use the same amount as the building does during this historic baseline period. So there are things that already are making that not true. Brian mentioned the building code. The building code has changed throughout you know, the past several decades, and recent updates mean that a building built in 2030 or even now won't perform as poorly in terms of energy as a building built and, and in existence during this time period. Um, so with that in mind, there are several wedges here, and these are showing strategies that um, cities can potentially have an impact over that can lead to reduction that are on by default. We have three of them shown here. Um, these include things like commercial and industrial building energy code enforcement, so just enforcing the energy code as it already is. <coughs> Same thing with residential buildings. And then this big chunk here is looking at each utility company's planned grid mix changes. So Excel um, today gets a certain percentage of their electricity from coal, from natural gas, from wind, from solar. Um, in the future, they're planning to shift that mix. And this is showing the emission savings that would be a result of that, those planned changes. You can see just with the default strategies on, 
and you can't see yet. So I'm going to scroll down slightly. There's a 28% reduction from that business as usual in 2040. So we can look at other ways of affecting those wedges, but first I'd like to talk just briefly about this goal line or desired conditions line. There are three different ways to set goals in the tool. We're currently showing carbon neutral by 2040, which is a um, pretty aggressive goal. There's also the Next Generation Energy Act goals that Brian mentioned. So this is showing um, a, a path <coughs> toward that 80% by 2050. And then acknowledging that perhaps because of this just being building energy and maybe buildings can make improvements at a faster rate than we can in travel, for example, cities can set their own custom goals. And this could be looking at being maybe somewhat more aggressive than the Next Generation Energy Act goals. I don't, oh, I, I forgot about the need to, uh, can I type in? Um, yes. That was I can. Yeah. What do you need? Yeah. Are you good? I'll let you know if I okay. need numbers typed in. Okay. <laughs> so three different ways to set goals. We're going to stick with carbon neutral by 2040 because that is um, St. Louis Park's proposed greenhouse gas emission reduction goal. So now that we have the understanding of the business as usual and the desired conditions, we can take a look at how, what strategies can impact um, the ability to get from one to the other. So these are divided into four categories, commercial industrial efficiency, residential efficiency, <coughs> electric grid mix, and renewable energy. Basically understanding that there are two ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from energy. One is to use less energy through efficiency, and the other is to use cleaner energy. And so that's what the orange versus the blue strategies are. And then within each of these, we see that there are ways to influence new buildings through energy codes, and then existing buildings through things like retrofit, um, appliance <coughs> equipment, fixture efficiency operations. So just take a look at a couple of these. In terms of um, commercial and industrial efficiency in new buildings, I already mentioned that this energy code enforcement strategy is on by default because it's already a requirement in Minnesota. A study a few years ago had 92% as the average compliance rate across the state. If a city thinks that they are able to achieve 100% compliance, they could bump that up. And then if a city is interested in going beyond the existing energy code, <coughs> there's also this stretch energy code. So this is where Brian had mentioned SB 2030. This models the state of Minnesota's Sustainable Buildings 2030 standard, which looks to achieve net zero energy building design by 2030. So within a building site, it's producing as much energy as it's using. Um, and uh, here we can turn this on and then adjust the compliance rate. So if a city like St. Louis Park has a green building policy that requires SB 2030 or equivalent <coughs> to be met on all of their commercial buildings that get a certain amount of financial assistance from the city, we might have a compliance rate of 15 to 30 percent. But if the city helps advocate for this, a statewide change, in the building energy code, whether it's an appendix to the energy code or a change in the actual energy code for all buildings, and this came up to 100%, you can see the difference that that would make. And you can also play around with, well, that probably won't happen by 2020, by 2020 but what if that happened by 2025? And then each year you kind of delay that. You're influencing fewer and fewer buildings, so that wedge is getting small. <coughs> For St. Louis Park existing buildings, so the following four are for existing buildings, we have, um, we we're able to gather building area data from the city and use that to determine, well, if the 200 largest buildings or 80 of the largest buildings and 100 of the mid-sized commercial buildings did retrofits or did appliance uh, equipment <coughs> efficiency, 
how, how far along could we get in terms of participation rate. And we found that if 200 of the buildings did retrofits, we would be able to hit about 50% of the square footage of buildings in the city. And the um, city had a goal of doing this by 2030. So you can see how that changed the orange bar somewhat there. Similarly, with appliance, equipment, and fixture efficiency, we can play around with this number based on what seems realistic for the city. And these two, um, I think it's important to notice that it might be really hard to get 200 buildings to do retrofits if you're just counting on people taking advantage of incentive programs from the utilities, so without a coordinated effort. And so this is where actions like looking at a benchmarking policy might come in handy, um, which is not included explicitly in here, but the type of thing where you're requiring commercial buildings to track and publicly disclose their energy use can help understand how we can increase these participation rates and what types of buildings to target for those retrofits or equipment replacement programs. So Brian will touch a little bit more on how cities can actually achieve the participation rates that we're plugging in here, but those are that's part of the discussion that we're having with St. Louis Park as we're filling this out. Efficient building operations is looking at operating the building's efficiency, and there's actually a lot of low-cost savings opportunity that's available um, based on how we're operating our buildings, looking at schedules, set points, um, maintenance, and replacement of equipment. Um, so that's, that's another one that I think they ended up around somewhere 76% for that. And then behavior change is a bit of a smaller impact in terms of the difference that the people who are using the buildings, plugging things into the walls, turning off lights can do, but it's something that um, can help create a culture of energy efficiency that can kind of spread to the, to the other um, strategies eventually. I'll also just note that these two strategies, building operations and behavior change, rely on like a continued engagement or commitment from the people who are operating and using the buildings. So if we stop this early, you can see that the savings from that strategy disappear. It needs continued engagement, whereas the other ones continue because once you replace a piece of mechanical equipment, it should continue to show those savings throughout the lifespan of that mechanical equipment. Many of these same strategies are available for the residential sector. And the participation rates might be slightly different. The energy savings rate might be different for a house versus a business. We know that houses tend to use more heating fuels like natural gas, whereas businesses have a more even split between electricity and natural gas in terms of their energy consumption. Um, and if you're interested in those types of details, you can check out the methodology document, which can be found at the top of the page here. And it describes the assumptions related to energy savings and default participation rates and everything like that. And then just a couple of minutes on the um, clean energy strategies. So we have some that are related to specifically the decisions that the utility company is making. So I mentioned that SPAN portfolio mix changes is on by default, and that's this big teal bar here, looking at how Excel, in this case, plans to change their um, grid mix between now and 2040. We can also look at the impact um, increasing our state's renewable energy standard from 25% to 50% of the grid portfolio being provided by renewable energy, and in this case, by the year 2030, um, how that would make a difference on that strategy. And then some of the things that are a little bit easier to impact at the local level are in this renewable energy wedge. So we have on-site photovoltaics where you can use the sources that Brian mentioned to type in the rooftop solar resource that's available within your community. And Krista, could I have you type in St. Louis Park is 286,513. Exactly. <laughs> 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 but who's counting? <laughs> I can keep track of a certain 
certain numbers, and that one felt important. Can I press enter? Uh, you don't need to do Okay. That. And then, so they have that much. It's economically viable solar rooftop resource um, available. But they probably aren't going to do 100% of that covered in solar panels right away. So they use Logo Pep's um, solar energy calculator, which is also available through this website, to determine what level of coverage they would need in order to hit the state's solar goal. So 10% of the city's electricity provided by solar by 2030 would require 13% of their viable rooftop area to be utilized um, for solar panels. And you could see, well, if we did 100%, how, how big would that wedge look? Mm. And then play around with the years, because you probably can't do 100% before 2020. <laughs> <at this point. laughs> but so that's hopefully how um, some of these tools can start to be overlapped to and from. The final strategies here are looking at um, consumer choice and how uh, the customers within the city are able to purchase green power from their utility companies through programs like Excel has a wind source and now a solar and wind option, um, and other utilities have different programs. And so in order to get to carbon neutral electricity, um, at this point, these types of strategies would need to be considered in addition to the efficiency and um, the on-site solar generation. So, so if I could explain again, the implementation period is the, the, lo the, the first number, 2020 in this case, is when you start. S start and then you build up the total implementation by the year 2040 in this case. Yeah, and it, it varies, the implementation period varies a little bit depending on the strategy. So when we looked at efficient building operations and you said, 60% of the building operators are going to be operating their buildings efficiently. <coughs> They're doing that throughout the entire time period. So that one is 100% uh, at the lower level, 2020. Exactly. Okay. Whereas retrofits, if you say 50% are going to have retrofits, they will have Program. been retrofitted by the end year. Okay. With some just linear growth in exactly. from zero to 100% yeah, exactly. of the goal. Okay. Yeah. And so the methodology document, if you're interested in Probably like so. solar resource, for example, okay. if it means when that's happening, it describes each of those. Okay. <laughs> Do we have time for a question from online? Yes. Um, can I see that mouse for a minute? Yes. Um, the first part of the question is, what does economically viable solar mean? Do you want to take that one, Brian? Sure. Do I need to stand up here? Yeah. If you want to be seen. Sure, if you want to be seen. <laughs> Um, Seen to be heard. Oh, yeah, yeah. An, economic, an economically viable solar resource is one that can be captured using existing technology um, to, today and produce an, the, uh, an adequate amount of energy from that um, for capture. So we, the, the, the technical term we use is um, any place that has at least, uh, I think it is 900,000 uh, watt hours of, of of energy on a given square meter of space over an, an over a year, and we pick that number because anything less than that means that it's probably too shaded in order to economically capture the resource. That the investment in the panel and the equipment and everything at that fourth, fourth point in time for anything less than that is going to not make economic sense. Anything more than that probably would make economic sense. Is that hopefully that clarifies it? Yeah, the second part was, um, or rather, is there a definition for economically viable in this example? So if that is true. Yeah, yeah, we, we use a specific a specific metric that is that's tied to um, the the current cost of equipment uh, and and installation cost for solar uh, solar energy. Um, obviously, as those costs go down, that the places that are economically viable will grow. So under current, and we're using today's standards. So uh, if the installed cost of solar is in Minnesota four dollars a watt, which doesn't mean much to most people in this room, but that's okay. That's our if that's our threshold. When it gets to two dollars a watt, the economically viable resource will actually be at a lower level because your your the installation cost has gone down, so you don't need as much solar in order to justify that investment economy. 
Thank you. Um, in terms of what's possible with the wedge diagram tool, I showed that you can you can basically get to carbon neutral electricity here through a combination of efficiency, on-site um, renewables, your utility company, and then purchasing green power purchase. You can't yet get all the way to carbon neutrality because the tool doesn't yet include some of the advanced thermal strategies. Brian talked about combined heat and power. He talked about thermal grid systems. Those types of things aren't included in here. And so St. Louis Park, um, to get to that goal, we'll need to be thinking about some additional options as well. And we do hope to include those types of advanced thermal strategies to hit that remaining natural gas um, energy in the next version of the tool. Are there any other quick questions about the wedge tool? Otherwise, um, Brian's planning to finish up with how you can translate this into actual city action. So I think it was the first one in the teal category um, about the resource planning of Excel energy. So I'm curious um, if there are cities um, yeah. not in the Excel territory those plans, uh, those utility plans, be reflected. Or yeah. are they for those yeah. specific cities? So the question is about the um, utility resource planning, and we do have the specific numbers for Excel. We have the specific numbers from I think about five or six of the biggest, and in this case, we're looking at utility providers, so Great River Energy, rather than the various co-ops and communities mm -hmm. that they would serve, and so through those six or so, we think we have the majority of the state. Um, other than that, we're using the Midwest regional um, averages from eGrid to do it. So it depends on which city you pull from the drop-down menu, which uh, storage it's looking at. Yes. Oh, okay. Yep, because they're also using those emissions, the storage emissions factors for these numbers here. And yep, so, so the database knows which utility is serving. So how many cities, again, is the wedge tool currently working currently for? Available? Yeah. It's currently 23, 23. cities, and then um, the 99 is hoped for by the spring. Right. Got it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> anybody looking at the barriers to getting to the implementation, just that the Great Plains Institute event that, I've, that we just held recently, um, <clears throat> heard over our conversations with people from Duluth and Edina, and trying to negotiate what you want to get per kilowatt hour with solar was complete, which was really different. Edina was struggling because what was being offered to them wasn't as good as what Duluth had been able to negotiate. With their utility company? <clears throat> yeah. Oh. So, I mean, there's, and I know just within, yeah, the long we have got chapters that have tried to do solar projects, and they work hard to get contracts, and then at the last minute, the solar vendor changes the financing, and they end up walking away because. So what I'm concerned about is the frustration level. I mean, you got a plan. We got to do this. I, you know, this is great, but are we bringing people together to kind of talk about the barriers and? Learn from each other as to how what they negotiated, what yeah. um, I think how we can move this forward because it isn't always the implementation <laughs> part has some real barriers yeah. just for my observation. And probably in multiple categories as well. So for the webinar folks, the question is about partnerships or contracts or agreements with utilities and how we're sharing stories between communities to understand um, how to overcome implementation barriers. And that's one of the elements, actually, of our current funding that Great Plains and LHB are working on um, for the Logo Pet project is trying to understand what some of those types of barriers are. So that, I think, is a good one that we should add to our list of um, something to track and to understand how one city is easily able to form a partnership with their utility or get solar development within their community and others aren't, and then figure out a way to, to share stories with that. And even what advocacy based on that, what right. we need to be pushing for within our system. Yep, absolutely. I'm just going to point out that a few green subsidies have posted um, a 
cities that have uh, cities that are procuring their electricity through a community solar garden. For example, the city of Jordan posted their city council decision packet, so you can see all I think it was four uh, four, uh, four vendors. Um, they made their pitch, and you can see the, the data and the, um, the financing package, and it's all there. And then you can see the staff recommendation, and then Jordan picked one of them, and uh, you can see the uh, walking it out to 2030 or 2040, I think. So, so a few. So we're beginning to see through Green Step City some of those uh, very fine details, um, just I agree, hugely useful. <coughs> We have one other question from online that says, um, when is the next version of the tool? That is a good question. <laughs> the, the next version of the tool is not currently funded, so if anybody has any ideas <laughs> about that, that would be very helpful. So otherwise, we have a very long wish list and uh, are needing to match funding to make it happen. The, the work that is funded is getting additional cities into the tool. <laughs> any, any large corporations that want to make a donation, you can be a hero. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, this is yeah, really. We have about six or so minutes left, and we just wanted to. So, these strategies, we know the gap is still in how do we implement this? How do we get 200 buildings to do retrofits? How do we get solar development to happen in the community? So I'm going to turn it back to the presentation and back to Brian to talk about some of the levers that local governments have to make these things happen. Yeah, so, so strategies, you know, existing conditions, desired conditions, strategies. That's what, ev what everyone wants to talk about first, um, and we have to kind of redirect them in the planning process and say, no, no, let's make sure we know where we're going before we pick the road that we're going to drive on. <laughs> so. Um, but it is, it is a critical part uh, of the planning process. This is just in case the wireless or the internet oh, doesn't see. work. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, and, and there are, um, as Joe was just, just saying, that, that there are a whole variety of um, strategies that you can use. It, 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 we thought about in the strategy section of local fab, how do we how do we show this? in a way that makes some sense. And we kind of thought, got overwhelmed of the hundreds of different kind of programs and contracts and methods and the details. So instead, we're, we take a, um, a, a kind of big picture look at strategies. And you need to think about strategies at the local level in, in four categories of general strategy. And that is encouragement, incentives, regulation, and public demonstration or leadership. And almost anything that you, any strategy can fit into any one of these four boxes. It talk, this is kind of saying this is the method by which you implement a strategy. For instance, um, you can, an example of encouragement is, let's see if we can get all of our city residents to join XL Energy's wind source program. Um, you're not gonna force them to do it, you're gonna say, hey, this is a good program, it barely costs you anything, and it helps us meet our greenhouse gas emission goals in our community. Wouldn't you like to do this? And you know what? Some people will say, hey, I didn't know about that. And really, it does help us meet our local goals. Well, I'm a good citizen. I'm going to do that. Sometimes all you have to do is ask, and people will do something that's consistent with your goal. Um, that's an example of, of, of uh, encouragement, action. A lot of times, similar encouragement is, Hey, did you know that solar energy was actually a cost-effective resource in many cases? Oh, I didn't know that. So suddenly they hear it from an unbiased source, the city, and they can move on with it. Incentives are when you actually get offer an inducement of some kind for someone to act consistent with your goal. Gee, wouldn't it be nice if you did energy efficiency in your building? Yeah, sure, but I don't really feel like doing it now. Well, how about if I give you a financial incentive? Oh, well, okay, then I'll do it. That's, that's a whole other category, and some of the things that we, we see at local governments do is, is the, the PACE financing. It's a local government initiative. That is an incentive. No one's required to do it, but it's an offering to get them to do it. Um, regulatory incentives within zoning or within, within the permitting processes where you say, um, if you do this, you get to move to the front of the line and get in your permit. 
um, if you do this, you get to, we're going to give you some other land use benefit in your development. Um, if you, if you uh, um, uh, agree to incorporate the net zero energy design in your buildings in your new city hall, or uh, the private sector, sorry, in your new uh, commercial building, we'll provide free technical assistance for you to do that. Then you go to the next category called regulation, which is where you you aren't asking whether they want to do it, but you're saying you must do it. Okay, and cities have a variety of different um, act actions that they can take that are regulatory. Um, zoning is one of the one of the primary ones, and also things like licensing and permitting processes also are city controlled and they are regulatory in nature. You can you can, for instance, require um, under certain kinds of zoning tools like the Plan Unit Development Ordinance, which some people in this room know what that is, um, you can require if someone's going down that zoning path for them to do things like energy efficiency or renewable energy. Um, it, you, it is a tool that you can use. You can adopt an energy benchmark ordinance, something that, um, did you mention that earlier? Yeah, the energy benchmark ordinance, where uh, city of Minneapolis has done this, for instance, where they require all buildings greater than 50,000 50, square feet, thank you, um, to uh, to uh, file their energy performance uh, for each one of those buildings publicly so that it's people who are looking to lease space or buy a building or anything know what the performance of that building is. And that's a regulatory requirement. And then finally, of course, public demonstration is where you say as a city, we're going to do this on our own property to demonstrate it. Um, how it works in, in, the, in the community, whether it's a you know, solar system or energy efficiency or biomass or whatever thing you're going to do. You're going to do electric vehicles in your fleet. These are things that you can do as public demonstration leadership. And oops, the Sustainable Buildings Code, the SB 2030 Code, for instance, has been implemented in some communities in different ways. Uh, Sean, so we could have her get up here and talk a while, we'll put you on the spot. <laughs> and Maplewood has done this, as has the city of St. Paul, um, where they, they, um, they actually use the SB 2030 in an incentive-based regulation, um, or incentive-based manner, where they said, if you, uh, uh, if you get money from us, if you agree to take our money on a project, you have to meet a new code. And I, I guess in Maplewood, you're not using SB 2030, but using an equivalent kind of green energy code, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and St. Paul has several different codes that you can meet for their green building. And, and St. Louis Park is doing this as part, they're taking the regulatory approach where they're saying, if you're going to do the PUD ordinance, if you're going to go through the PUD, um, or is it the green building? It's just uh, finance, any city. Finance. Any city finance, okay. Or PUD. Green building. Or PUD, okay, either one. Um, yeah. Then you are required to meet the more stringent code standard. Um, and obviously there are a number of cities in the state that have actually adopted this um, for city buildings. In fact, any state-funded building is required to use the SB 2030 code, any state-bonded building. And that includes some local buildings. But other local governments have actually chosen to do that on their own as a public leadership thing for all the buildings they're going to build are going to be built to this higher level standard ultimately to get to a net zero energy building. So you can see, you can, you can just recommend it, you can provide an incentive for it, you can put it in your regulation, you can do it in your public building. It's the same strategy, the kind of SB 2030 standard, it can be done in four different ways. Similarly, we have electric vehicle kind of discussions that are going on around the state. How do you as a city get people to do uh, purchase electric vehicles or encourage the kind of market transformation in terms of getting ultimately a lot of part, large part of your community to use electric vehicles? Um, encouragement, what does that mean? Well, you just kind of provide information to people. You say electric vehicles are now the cheapest kind of vehicle to own and operate that you can possibly buy. That's a true statement and it can be documented, but very few people know it. So just letting them know what the information is and kind of doing myth busting around what the drawbacks are is an educational effort, it's encouragement. Incentives, what can you do for incentives at the local level? Well, let's create a local bulk buy program to participate so our residents can, uh, can all get together and we're going to get a $3,000 discount from, from Nissan or from you know, Chevrolet for their electric vehicle for our community 
so that um, if you participate in it, you, you get to uh, get that discount. Um, you can um, set an incentive for, for building owners to install charging equipment in their new apartment buildings or in their commercial facilities so that when someone drives to work or they come home if they live there, they can plug in their vehicle without any problem and get it charged up. Um, regulation. You can do EV and regulation. You can say in our parking standards in our community, we're going to require you to have 5% of the spaces in any commercial lot be wired for electric vehicle and, um, charging installation. That's a power that the local government has. You can implement it in the case of EVs. It's a regulatory approach to, implement, to, to encourage electric vehicles. And obviously in public demonstration, you can choose to start incorporating electric vehicles into your fleet. Uh, Minneapolis just announced, uh, <laughs> I think, the uh, something like 50% or 100% uh, anyway of their fleet that they want to convert to electric vehicles. So that, that's kind of the, the, the strategy approach and the way we want you to initially look at it. Um, this is our resources, whole pile of resources that we have um, that uh, you can don't have to digest all now, but uh, you can reference after this, um, after this presentation. And uh, the final thing, is this the final thing? I can't remember where we're at in the presentation. Um, the call to action, I kind of said that, you know, Abby is now going back to lock the door. Um, and uh, no city here gets to leave until they commit to putting in their comprehensive plan energy goals and climate goals. Okay. No, not really, but still, and the people in the webinar are kind of going, whew, we're reviewing it. <laughs> but still, that's the call. The call to action really is we have an opportunity when you're doing this planning process once every 10 years in the metro area, and some communities actually out in greater Minnesota, this is the opportunity to really address this. You don't have an easy number, another bite at the apple. Um, this is the, the easy way to do it. It's, it's a very simple thing that you can do just in terms of incorporating this into your goals, and it really enables all kinds of action that's going to happen over the next 10 years in this rapid transformation of the market we're seeing for energy and local energy. You know, it do almost doesn't matter whether or not you want electric vehicles in your community because they're coming. And so if you, you need to think about how you're going to do electric vehicle infrastructure, and you need to enable your staff to do that through setting the goals now in your comprehensive plan. So, there we go. I don't know that I don't know if we do have time for more questions. We can take five minutes. So I'm not sure about that. <clears throat> You're not sure about that? Well, I don't know how much time Yeah. We can take three minutes or so. Are there any questions? <laughs> I'm sure we answered them already anyway. Lots of information. Quick comment too, because your question really resonated with me. Um, and we hear that a lot from cities, not even just in Minnesota, but across the entire U.S. and really across the globe. And uh, another thing that all this information is so great, and if you're entering into barriers or you're finding yourself stuck, don't be afraid to reach out to a partner, right? Whether it's an engineering or architecture firm or a Great Plains Institute, Green Sub Cities, a private company. Um, because a lot of those companies are really pushing those market changes and they're ahead of them. So if you have questions, feel free to just reach out. I mean, we're all kind of in this together and here to help each other succeed and support each other on goals like this because it is critical. We have to be doing this from a market, economic, energy, social, every, political, everything. So don't be afraid to just reach out and ask the question because there's a lot of people who are working on stuff that have a lot of answers. Yeah. There's those search people. You can hear from. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, we have another question from online that asks, um, with electric vehicles, how can we find out data around EVs in our city? For example, the count or percent of vehicles or residents that are EVs. Well, that's actually, actually the, the uh, data source that we did not mention here um, but we do occasionally talk about is the um, the city's leaf um, that is, is, is that the National Renewable Energy Lab um, has created for every single city in the nation, 23,000 cities. Um, there is a database of, of how much energy is used in the city, how many vehicles there are, how many, how many they've aggregated a huge amount of data. And um, 
It's got DOE, City Energy Profile. City, yeah, there you go. City Energy mm -hmm. Sled is, is what they kind of they, they go by. Um, but it, it is uh, in that data set, there is, uh, they have, uh, NREL purchased a data set of every single vehicle that is registered in every single city throughout the nation. Um, and so they can actually tell you, and, it, and it's a little bit dated now, I think, that data, but nevertheless, they will tell you how many vehicles are electric, how many vehicles are flexible fuel, how many vehicles are um, heavy duty versus light duty, and, and, and they have also computed a specific energy efficiency, fuel efficiency number based upon the registrations in that community in their estimations of energy use. So that's that one data set that they have that we do not have that you can go to um, in order to kind of find that out. And again, it's kind of, that information is dated. I know that they're talking about maybe updating it to 2016 data, um, and which would be good. Uh, I don't know if that's quite ready to go yet. Yeah, right now it looks like 0% uh, electric vehicles, basically. And that is something, you know, we were passing around documents of, of these tools, and um, we are for metro cities and a few greater Minnesota cities doing these um, existing condition reports, which does include um, the information of the, the fuel breakdown of vehicles within your community as well. Brian, Becky, might we get from, um, I don't know, Commerce or MnDOT or whoever whoever registers vehicles in Minnesota, might we start to get live data in terms of um, characterization of vehicles in city registration? By city? Yeah. Um, my, my understanding is that data set is only collected by a private company, which is why the, 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 the state doesn't have it readily available. Um, I mean, it's obviously it's public information because they had to get it somehow. But, yeah. Um, but the compilation of it is has not been done, I don't think, mm. at the state level by city. They do it for the state as a whole. As a whole. Not for, not for breakdown of okay. um, Really quick. Through Green Step Cities, is there an easy way to search to find out like cities that are have already installed um, the charging stations and things like that if they if they are registered so that maybe we can work with those cities to try to find out the best way to do it in our city? Uh, there is. If you go on the um, best practices tab on Green Step, there's a show me all, there's a little at the top of that page, there's a little filter, uh, show me all actions related to, and there's a drop down. Okay. So if you click on the drop down and click EVs and click filter, then you'll see there are like eight or nine EV actions. And, and, and the one you'd want to pick, you know, whatever, I mean, there are various actions related to promoting, encouraging, increasing EVs and pick the one you want and go to that action and then look on the, when you get to the action, there's the who's doing it tab. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that might be a great way for barriers too. Mm -hmm. so yeah, to, because then to you can see. find people who have achieved it so that you can exactly. maybe. Right, and we will be, um, maybe next week, uh, putting out a report on the step four and step five cities and a number of them have reported charging stations and number of charging stations and then I believe the Department of Energy has maps and you can see all of the charging stations anywhere, really. All of the public charging stations are have been identified. There, I've seen yeah. that one, yeah. but that's with corporate and everything like corporate garages and stuff. So that doesn't necessarily. Any cities that are putting them in oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, need, public. Yeah. Yeah. Just one in cities. There's not a. Yeah. There's not a. Filter. But green stuff, not like that. Uh, yeah. That would be. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, do we have time for one more? Mm -hmm. Real quick. Okay. Um, and then you get ready. <laughs> um, are there any advantages to a city owning and operating its municipalities regarding energy use profiles, clean energy resources, and energy planning and action? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, yeah, the question is about, um, I think, municipal utilities versus being part of a cooperative or part of an investor-owned utility. And we have seen um, several cities that are do have municipally-owned utilities across the nation. It makes it Somewhat, it's definitely more in their control to get to some of these goals. So if they are able to switch to a 100% carbon neutral um, portfolio, then basically they're able to do that for their city and they don't have to worry about kind of the larger scale and the implications of doing that. And then um, also unis feel like they, they should be able to work with the goals of the city specifically because they are serving that. Yeah, and, 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 and there is a, a path of, a, a lower path of, of collaboration 
but we have not necessarily seen that borne out in reality. That sometimes, in Minnesota, yeah. yeah, that sometimes we actually yeah, get better action on the on the yeah. investor owned utilities than we do from the municipal. So it's it's kind of a mixed bag. Okay, Alexa. All right. Hi everybody. Good morning, and good morning to the people on the webinar. Thanks for joining. Um, we are majorly switching gears here, but it's great <laughs> because you just saw something at like a really high level of planning long term. This is like brass tacks, literally screw something in tomorrow if you have the item in your hand, okay? Uh, more small scale, more at that behavior change level for change. Um, and I am Alexis Trashness again. Uh, I have this crazy title, Behavior Change and Metrics Coordinator. So we can talk about that another time. Uh, but in general, if you aren't familiar with CERTs, the Clean Energy Resource Team, we help people and their communities get projects done by connecting them to the resources they need. And when we talk about clean energy, we of course mean both energy efficiency and renewables and a lot of other exciting things coming online like storage and, and other things like that. Um, we work all across the state in seven regions with and through four partners. Um, and we do our work across these three platforms, Learn, Connect, and Act. And under Learn, we um, host energy stories. So every couple weeks, if you'd like to sign up for Minnesota Energy Stories, you'd get about five blogs in your inbox uh, every other week that are talking about really cool things happening in Minnesota. Quiz time, what do you think is the topic or the blog, if you are that savvy, that is the most popular blog on the CERT website and in the from the energy story. The topic. Shoot out some topics. Oh, LED. Lighting. Lighting. Interesting. Solar. Solar would be another good one. Water. Water. Getting warmer. <laughs> <laughs> Due to time, I'll cut it off there. It is this article no. from 2012 All right, Carl. about these wonky no. little guys called faucet aerators. The little job you do is you screw on the end of your faucet to reduce um, the flow of water, no. which then reduces hot water energy use. Um, and we get heads from all across the nation and world about this topic uh, annually. It is the number one article on our website. So we knew there's, a, there's still a, a drive, still a motivation on this topic for what we call small plug and play energy and water saving items. Um, back to what we do, we help people connect, mark your calendars, CERT conference 2018, March 28th and 29th, it's going to be a party where over 500 <laughs> Minnesotans get together, we talk about clean energy, we make plans for action on clean energy, we'd love to have everybody here there. Um, and lastly, we help everyone act. That's in our mission. We're reviewing probably almost 100 seed grant applications right now, or maybe maybe less than that, maybe more like 60 total across the state. Um, and we deliver research-based campaigns. And that's what I'm here to share with you today about is one of our research-based campaigns. Um, campaigns are the way that we try to help people take clear and actionable ways to save energy. As we heard, someone thought solar might be the most popular blog on CERTS's website, and that is really exciting. But we use these campaigns to bring excitement and energy to energy efficiency, because sometimes it gets left, left unthought of <laughs> and, and left behind. So these are some past campaigns we've run, so those of you who are kind of in the, the CERTS fan club and know us for many years. You've probably heard of and remember several of these older campaigns, um, past campaigns where we helped gas station owners. We had two families going head to head to save energy and recruited teams uh, to also save energy in their own homes. And then make a splash. So for a couple years, uh, we ran it a couple times um, from 2011 to 2013 where we were helping to, um, we were actually selling these things called dish sprayers or pre-rinse spray valves, faucet aerators, that thing that the blog was about, and shower heads, low flow shower heads. So today is the, you know, I'm sharing with you today the resurgence of those smaller water and energy saving products 
our uh, new launch of this campaign is Saving Lots and Drops, and I'm specifically telling you about the bulk buys track, and there's another track I'll mention at the very end. This is where we're helping cities and other similar community level groups distribute these plug and play energy and water saving products for free or at a low cost if you need to recoup a little bit of the cost. So this is where you find some money in your budget to just get some action, these what seems like small actions uh, happening. But I'm going to show you how it adds up. All these little watts and all these little drops add up to big energy savings. All right, so Green Step Cities, that's what we're here for, right? <laughs> so you, these are the actions, the best practice actions that you can take credit for by doing saving lots and drops bulk buys. Um, if you, it depends on which audience you're working with, like who you're distributing these items to. If you're doing it within your own city buildings or school buildings, it would fall under best practice 1.3. If you're doing it with your residential sector, it would fall under 2.1. And if you were doing it with businesses, the, the CNI sector, that would be 25.2. So uh, stamp, stamp of approval, you get to, to take credit and move, move forward with Green Step City. Um, okay, so what is it that CERTS is offering in this campaign? We are here to be your partner in crime as you, you launch and take off this you know, take this program to your community. Um, if you were familiar with Make a Slash, you actually purchased the items through CERT. That's not, that's not what we're doing here anymore. Now we are helping you run this program yourself, and we're going to be with you every step of the way to help you, you know, find your path on this. So we look at, um, you know, first, you know, what item do you want to distribute? What makes sense? What's going to match well with some city goals that you have, where might you get these items, um, how you're actually going to distribute them, so make a plan with how are these going to actually get into the hands of the audience that you're, you're targeting, either residential, city, or business, and helping you spread the word. So we will have you know, a draft press release for you to use, and uh, newsletter pieces if you're you know, struggling for language to, you know, to share with the world. So we are there to help create that content with you. And these are the products we're supporting through this campaign. So we've got a couple on the energy side with LED light bulbs, very easy to install, and uh, advanced power strips. They're smart power strips. They save energy um, from other devices that are plugged into outlets um, controlled by a single master outlet. And then water saving devices, which as I said, the reason why we are, as an energy group, looking at these is because they're saving hot water and the energy required to eat that water, which is happening behind me right now. <laughs> the sea kettle thing. Um, but shower heads, uh, this is that faucet aerator again, and then the pre-rinse spray valve. Those you'll see in um, congregation center kitchens, um, restaurants, senior living centers, community, you know, city or county um, jails you know, have a food a cafeteria sometimes. So um, over the years, as you can tell from our most popular blog on the first website, we have a deep understanding of each of these products and um, can help guide you to getting them into your community. <coughs> we do suggest just, you know, you know, trying one product to start or a couple, you know, it's up to you if you want to go hog wild or if you have the capacity and resources to do more than one. And you really can set, you know, how much you want to do based on your community's budget or capacity to do the work. And all of these can count towards a statewide energy savings goal of 1.5% year after year. So if um, you're a municipal utility, um, as a city too, uh, you'd be able to take credit for the energy savings here. And if you're a city and partnering with your utility, they might be interested in um, capturing the energy savings toward their uh, conservation program. So where to get these items? Um, one place you can go is quantityquotes.net and that's a slightly different uh, website than you see as usual. So .net, it's a, a free online marketplace for these competitive quotes on these plug and play items and other items as I'll show you. All of the items in this marketplace, it's basically a place for you to meet vendors. 
and then from there you can place your order, but you can get uh, multiple quotes on the same item. Uh, and all of the items are Water Sense and Energy Star certified. So this is a website originally developed by the Department of Energy and now it's being managed by the nonprofit in California. Um, as I said, Water Sense, Energy Star, those are the two great certifications you want to keep an eye out for when you purchase these kinds of products. These are all the kinds of products that are available on quantityquotes.net. So you can see it's more than just the plug and play stuff. They've got appliances, um, you know, to work towards some of those other, you know, bigger goals we saw in the logo pep effort. And these are all the vendors, you know, so there's going to be a lot of competition and a lot of options for the pricing. And it, it feels like you're kind of placing an order when you're in this tool. Basically, you create your own profile and then you place your order. And uh, But it's simply a request. So this says submit purchase request. You're not actually putting any credit card numbers in or anything like that. Um, and then over time, you get responses directly to your, your email inbox. Um, and then you can go into the tool and look at all the responses from various vendors um, with uh, a really initial quote to get you started and then kind of takes the transaction offline. But if you, um, quantity quotes is just one option. Some of you as cities might have your own vendor connections. And then if you really just want help, please reach out to CERT. Um, myself or our regional coordinators um, can help uh, source a couple of bids for you to consider. Um, reviewing distribution plans, so there's a lot of, um, this is where the creativity comes in and we love to work with um, city commissions or others to brainstorm, you know, what would be the right approach for your community. But you could be giving them away for free at events. Um, if you needed to recover a little cost, like on that sprayer valve, the dish sprayer, that can be almost a $60 item. So um, <coughs> if you can't get a really great bulk price because you're only buying like a dozen of them, um, you might need to recoup a little bit of that cost from the restaurant or, you know, but that's uh, different for every product. Um, and then um, picking up kits from City Hall um, are some other ideas and I'll, I'll give you a case example here in a moment. And then spreading the word. So a lot of times when you buy items in bulk, you're as a city, you're going to get this box of like 200 faucet aerators and they're going to each be in their own little baggie and then that's it. <laughs> so um, we're here to help out with like a little piece. This, this piece is actually only about a quarter of an eight and a half by 11 sheet that says, you know, where should you use this? How do you install it? What kind of energy and water and money savings might you expect? So a little something more to go with the item to kind of encourage that energy efficiency culture. Um, we can help you out with pieces like that and um, helping you with your outreach materials, like I mentioned earlier, social media posts as well. So here's an example effort, and this is not that fictitious. I left it generic because um, we are in the planning stages, but uh, in September I met with Falcon Heights Environmental Commission <laughs> leaders, as, as usual, and they are getting excited about just getting light bulbs out in their community and they want to have something from the commission, you know, um, that they're doing that. So they're looking at distributing a thousand bulbs um, and these are the ideas they already have on the table that we're going to refine and, and craft further. But uh, they're thinking just go door to door and have some conversations with neighbors. And if it's a porch light right there that they use all the time, they might even install it for them right on the spot just to like get it done and make it happen. Um, have them available at City Hall. This is a really great new idea um, that I think is creative and should produce some really exciting results. Is to work through apartment managers. So there's a single point contact for multiple units, hundreds of thousands of bulbs probably. <laughs> um, so that's a great opportunity. And then of course at community events and just show the leadership of the city. So very exciting. So let's say we were curious about what kind of impact does a thousand bulbs have? Well, there's a great EPA uh, carbon emission equivalency calculator tool you can use. Um, and in the end, these, uh, just these thousand bulbs would result in 41 metric tons of carbon savings. 
And what is this really? It's like taking nine vehicles off the road for a whole year um, and remove, you know, not driving a car for 100,000 miles. You know, so it really turns into some real energy savings. Here's another example. It would be like taking four and a half homes off the energy grid just by saving 1,000, er, by switching out 1,000 incandescent light bulbs to LED light bulbs. So savings just really add up. And that's what Saving Lots and Drops is all about. As I mentioned, there's a second track to Saving Lots and Drops, and it's a fundraiser option. So this is more targeted at community and youth groups looking to make a little money. So instead of selling you know, wrapping paper or coupon books, they could be selling these items that have a lasting environmental impact. Um, so if that's something you're also interested in learning more about, um, I can talk to you about that um, another time, but I just wanted you to be aware that there are kind of two options, and um, the bulk buy option is just a really great one for communities. And if you were wondering how to get involved, um, the website you can visit is pretty pretty easy, savingwattsdrops.org slash bulk buy. And once you get there, it kind of gives a lot of the summary of what I just shared uh, today just quickly on the website to refresh your memory, and there's a form at the very bottom. Um, and you can fill out that form, and that'll let CERTS know that you're interested. You can also work with your CERTS regional coordinator, who is kind of your regional point person on energy topics for Green Step City. That would work as well, or you can reach out to me. So with that, that's my contact info, and I brought business cards too. Um, are there any questions about this opportunity? This time, or just even about. What about the? Uh, I know the uh, state has a cooperative venture purchasing program where um, where the state has uh, sort of a range for bids and so forth. I forget. Do they do they have a selection where you can click on, you know, filter to show me only you know, Energy Star or uh, uh, Water Sense? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and I thought that was for bigger ticket items like uh, street lighting and everything, but maybe it maybe comes down into this. I'm not level. aware. Okay. Do you have to be a, a member of the cooperative venture program to actually see the items? So I okay. I've not seen them. All right. I'm going to look into that as an alternative to the quantity quotes. That could be another source yeah. that you have right at their fingertips. Is there like some minimum that makes it a bulk? Um, in the hundreds, yeah. Um, but you can go low. Like it depends on the item. Mm -hmm. So with like a, the more expensive items of the power strip is a little bit pricier, and the dish sprayer, um, you could probably hit between 50 and 100, and that would be bulk for that type of item. Um, but you definitely, if you can get upwards of 300 for the light bulbs, then you're talking about bulk prices. And um, and the bulk prices I'm familiar with from vendors um, might seem high in the metro area because of the, the on-shelf uh, rebates we see at the store. So now a day, you can get an LED light bulb for like a dollar or two. Um, so like with Falcon Heights, for example, you know the if I were to go out and try to get a thousand bulbs for them, I might be able to get that at a price of between two fifty and three dollars. And so um, their plan, because they just want this to happen, uh, they might go out to this area stores and just buy the the bulbs for a dollar each. That is fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> Any way you want to get your bulbs is great. But if you don't, you know, for the more, you know. Uh, places that don't have those on-shelf rebates or don't have access to quite low enough prices, um, you know, I, we can help source to a vendor. And the other idea could be, you know, if we know five cities kind of want to do it all at once, we can now group all those mm -hmm. quantities together to get an even better price. Is there anything you're doing to um, get multiple cities to go in together? Or? Uh, not at this time. I mean, this is one of the earlier, like, more official kind of launches of this this side of the saving lots and drops for bulk buy. So um, if we want to do something within Green Step City, mm -hmm. kind of a just you know 
set a timeline of a couple months, you know, make it make a decision within your city and yeah. take it to your environmental commissions and everything to see if it's an activity you want to do and then and then move on with one big order. That would be very exciting. We could, that would be, we could think about wow, that. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Any questions for Alexa? Well, thanks so much for your time, and my colleague Pete is going to switch back, you know, gears to some, this is like a pendulum today, planning, really big stuff, you know, brass tacks, easy, small stuff to implement, and now kind of in the middle, solar financing, you know, go for a, a project of a, a slightly bigger scale. <laughs> Thank you, Alexa. Mm -hmm. There you should be. Ah. So this is not good. Oh. Keep going. There's like 80. Oh, actually, sorry, guys. You get to see all the uh, slides that were just in case people ask oh. questions. Oh, uh, so it's all on the too. fundraiser Look preview. Look at all these <laughs> There it is. Oh, Youth yes. Energy Summit. <laughs> and it all boils down to the punchline of Decatur teams at the end. But that's only a few minutes. Behavior change. Uh, hey. hey. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I thought Alexis's presentation was outstanding. Uh, so I'm with the clean energy resource teams, but I'm also the mayor of Falcon Heights. And I thought the part where she talked about how amazing the city of Falcon Heights <laughs> was <laughs> fairly good. I don't know about you, but... Um, so, uh, I am going to talk about solar financing, but since I do have a captive audience of primarily cities, uh, I do want to talk about energy efficiency for just one minute. And before you grab onto that shiny uh, solar item, think about energy efficiency first. That's always your starting point. Why pay money uh, for a 100 kW solar array when really if you focus on energy efficiency first, you can get away with purchasing a 75 kW solar array, for example. So uh, there are a few, there's at least a couple uh, state programs that can help cities uh, do energy efficiency. And one is LEAP. Sorry, this is a little hard to read. One is LEAP, the Local Energy Efficiency Pro Program. The second is the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program. Both of these will help uh, cities accomplish best practice number one, which deals with public buildings. So, if you're thinking, gosh, uh, wouldn't it be great if I really had a solid understanding of all of my facilities in my, in my city? Uh, what energy uh, looks like uh, in all of those different facilities and street lights? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to understand uh, how much savings I could generate by making improvements in these in these facilities, and what the cost would be for making changes. Well, there's a couple of different ways to do that. There's uh, low cost or no cost ways to get a walkthrough. One is RETAP, Retired Environmental Technical Assistance Program, free program through the MPCA, and they will do a walkthrough of your public facilities and they will produce a report that's probably about 10 pages long, 15 pages long or so. It will be helpful for your city. That's great. The other uh, is the local energy efficiency program. And through going through LEAP, you'll get a very detailed, what's called an investment grade audit. And this is what you will get at the end. This is an investment grade audit for the city of Bemidji. And it goes into a ton of detail, a whole three ring binder full of detail about your 
City Hall, Community Center, Library, Wastewater Treatment Plant, um, all of the energy that's, that's being consumed, and ways that you can save energy. The, a, a related program, this is, these are both uh, Department of Commerce, State Department of Commerce programs, and we have Peter Berger in the back. Peter, wave, wave your hand uh, with the Department of Commerce who manages the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program. So one takeaway from this is uh, if you have any questions, if you would like to see a report like this, uh, talk to me or Peter Berger after the program here. Guaranteed Energy Savings Program, you'll also get an investment grade audit, uh, but it will provide technical and financial assistance all the way through the program, all the way through the project. Not just the audit, but seeing uh, these, uh, these uh, cost savings realized through energy conservation measures. And by the way, I'm glad, so glad you mentioned uh, partnering with the private sector because through the local energy efficiency program, uh, the state has master contracts with a number of engineering firms to do these investment grade audits. And through the Guaranteed <coughs> Energy Savings Program, the state has master contracts with, I believe the number is 10 or 11 uh, ESCOs, energy savings uh, companies, Siemens being one of them, I believe. The other item I wanted to mention is before you do solar for your own uh, your own city, think about ways to make it easy for your residents, your businesses to do solar. One of which is, uh, Brian may have mentioned this, the Grow Solar Local Government Solar Toolkit for planning, zoning, and permitting, much like Green Step Cities. This outlines the best practices that Minnesota cities can do, and it is specifically designed for, the, for cities uh, or local governments within Minnesota. Abby had a big part of, uh, of putting this together. I happen to have one uh, right here, and uh, if you're interested, you can, you can take this away with you. And SoulSmart. SoulSmart is a national program to make your community solar ready. It's really about addressing the, uh, the red tape, um, the, the so-called soft costs with solar development. So it's about uh, making your permitting, your inspection process uh, efficient. Um, so for example, uh, it encourages cities to have a checklist for permitting. So the resident or the business or the solar developer knows exactly what he or she needs to bring in uh, to City Hall to get a permit. All right, let's talk about solar financing. There's at least four ways um, for financing, one of which is green pricing. You may be familiar with this concept. Think, uh, uh, think wind source is a green pricing uh, program. It's it's typically where you pay a bit of a premium uh, to tap into renewables. The most recent example would be Excel's Renewable Connect program, uh, specifically for, uh, for local governments. Um, City of Minneapolis recently purchased, I think it's that 17 million, uh, 17 million kilowatt hours uh, they, do, they do pay a bit of a premium. As I mentioned, the uh, city of Minneapolis estimates that premium to be about 6%, maybe up to uh, 10, 12% of a premium. But for their policy makers, they said, yep, um, we're, we are paying a little bit more, but that's a priority for us. The University of Minnesota also uh, purchased um, a renewable connect subscription. It's kind of, a, it's almost like a hybrid between um, a traditional green pricing program and uh, a community solar garden. The real benefit with Excel's program is that you, you the city, are able to, uh, are 
able to keep the renewable energy credits, the RECs. So you are able to say that you are utilizing uh, renewable energy, in this case, solar and wind. I'll go into more detail on these uh, two other items, direct ownership and third party. Um, so this is third party uh, solar financing. You know what, before I talk about that, let me talk about direct ownership. This is uh, the city of Hutchinson. This is probably the, the coolest example that I can think of. 400 uh, KW solar array. This is their wastewater treatment uh, plant right here. And it was by far the city's largest energy user. In 2015, they installed this uh, 400 KW array. They helped pay for it pretty sizable chunk of change through an XL RDF uh, grant, Renewable Development Fund. And this is funds, I think this year it's around 40 to $50 million that XL sets aside uh, for these types of projects. They're, they're typically larger projects. They're typically projects that um, can be replicated across the state. And uh, uh, and I'd say many of the RDF grant recipients have been uh, local governments. It's all behind the meter, by the way. So it's so this power is all being used for their wastewater treatment plant. The other means for direct ownership is. Uh, fund through the St. Paul Port Authority. It's a lease program called the Energy Savings Partnership. Uh, again, it's a lease, so you pay a lease payment, a uh, lease that with an interest that's pretty competitive, maybe 2 to 3 percent is the typical lease uh, interest rate. There's a loan loss reserve uh, uh, through U.S. Bank, I believe, of $2 million, uh, so that helps buy down that interest rate. City of Moundsview did a combined energy efficiency project and a solar project, 80 kW array, uh, 40 on their city hall, 40 on their community center, I believe, and uh, financed it through the Energy Savings Partnership. A lot of cities uh, and local governments utilized stimulus funds a few years back. The uh, city of St. Paul has probably a half dozen. Um, solar arrays that they help finance through the stimulus funds. I wouldn't count on that coming down the pike <laughs> anytime soon, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Hey, you forgot a coolest thing about that. You're <coughs> sitting on top of a closed Oh thing. my gosh, I forgot about the coolest <laughs> thing about that. About that. <laughs> this, yeah, so solar array, underneath the solar array is a um, 1970s, 1980s, Closed landfill. So it's a it's a brown field or was a brown field that's now been turned to a bright field. <laughs> Super cool. And they have uh, so you you can imagine the engineering challenges that go into putting anything on top of a closed landfill. Uh, you don't want to be digging in right or really putting in uh, pylons uh, into a closed landfill. Uh, so they figured out a, a ballast system, um, and it, it's just, you're right, it's super cool. And there's tons of brownfields across Minnesota. Uh, that's part of the replicability of um, the RDF funds. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for cities, counties with brownfields to put solar on top of them because you know what, you can't put, it's hard to put anything on top of a land. Right, solar uh, is a perfect example of what you can do. Anything uh, you'd like to add to that? Okay. All right, let's talk about third-party financing. So, 
direct ownership pretty much between the consumer and the utility. Third party, you have the consumer, you have your utility, but you also have the system owner, which is the third party. Uh, typically, these third party um, financing deals, uh, the system owner owns, owns the array. Uh, pays for it, um, maintains it. There is no upfront cost or, or limited upfront cost to the city. So that's a huge benefit. You get a, a, a million dollar solar array on top of City Hall for zero upfront cost to the city. What you do pay is a uh, you pay for the power that is that is produced by that solar array. So the typical arrangement is, and there's it gets complicated. There's different ways to do it, but the typical arrangement is the city enters into a power purchase agreement with the system owner. So you are entering into an arrangement, an agreement, contract for 15 years, 20 years, 25 years with this third party to purchase power at a, at a set rate uh, for that length of time. There's also typically a buyout um, period. Maybe it's after six years or 10 years uh, where the city can opt to purchase the array outright. The reason why that's, that's in there, specifically the six years, is because the system owner is a private entity. They get to take the private, the, uh, the tax credit, 30% federal tax credit. They also uh, take advantage of accelerated depreciation on their taxes. <coughs> That's the challenge with direct ownership. Cities don't pay taxes. Cities don't get the benefit of a tax credit. So that's why I mentioned there's, out, there's regularly uh, grants associated with these types of arrangements. So uh, benefits, low or no uh, upfront costs, you get the advantage in an indirect way of the federal tax credit. Um, you're in an agreement for whatever the period of time is of that power purchase agreement, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. You know what you're going to be paying as a city um, for that period of time. And, uh, and you don't own it. They own it. So they're responsible for maintaining it and operating it, carrying insurance on it, those sorts of benefits. One of the challenges is uh, transaction costs. Um, this is not a turnkey approach. The city of Falcon Heights did this back in 2011, went online in 2012. It took the city council about a year from the day we found out this was an option to when we flip the switch on our 40 kW array. And we had tons of uh, city council meetings about this. You want to make sure that you're entering into a good deal. So um, that those transaction costs, that time commitment can be challenging. With that in mind, CERTS, Clean Energy Resource Teams, has uh, taken one hopefully significant step to minimize those transaction costs uh, by creating a model request for proposals. This is brand new. Uh, we don't even have it on our website yet. So it's, it's literally uh, hot off the shelf. And uh, about a year or so ago, we learned that the city of Woodbury was interested in doing a third party arrangement. And uh, 
The challenge with the city of Woodbury, and I think this is typical with other local governments, is they they had been approached by a number of solar developers, and uh, solar developer comes to the city and says, you know, we think we can, we've got a good project for you. We want to put in 100 kW solar array on top of your ice arena, and it's going to cost you this much. You can finance it this way. And then the next week, another developer comes in and says, hey, we got a great deal for you. We want to put it on top of City Hall. It's going to be 150 kW array. And then next week, et cetera, another developer comes in. So they're having multiple proposals with different um, sizes at different locations. It's really challenging for the city to make an apples to apples comparison on what deal is best. So, uh, <clears throat> CERTS worked in partnership with uh, the city of Woodbury and an engineering firm called KFI Engineering out of Roseville to develop a model request for proposals. And this is beneficial, uh, issuing an RFP because it, it kind of forces you to think ahead about where exactly you want that solar array. Um, it, it forces you to really look at um, what, your, what tariff you're under right now um, and your building's uh, energy usage. Um, and, uh, and then you don't have to, quite frankly, you don't have to start with a blank slate. Uh, with creating a, a request for proposals, and you're able to send it out to 70 solar developers. And by the way, CERTS will help you send out that RFP to uh, developers in our area um, so that you know when you're looking at these responses uh, that you're, you're, getting the best, you're getting the best price, the best deal. So with that, we've got the uh, RFP ready to go. It's going to be online uh, on the CERTS website here shortly. And uh, there's my contact information. If you, if you just really want to get it uh, when you get back to the office right, right away, I can send it your way. Happy to answer any questions. There'll be a search blog about this, probably. I yeah, and I'm see. sure it's going to be the most popular blog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't you think? I mean, that uh, faucet. Right. <laughs> I know. But do make you have a faucet. <laughs> Maybe you should tag it like <laughs> solar aerators. Or <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Coming for you. I love <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> Solar what is a tariff? Alexis, help me. What's a, what is a, a it's it's the um, uh, it's the um, price that you're paying. Um, like so, an Excel tariff could be um, that you are a small business um, and you are paying this set amount. Um, you could be under a peak controlled tariff. This, this starts getting out, out outside my general uh, uh, expertise here, but if you are a business, um, a manufacturing business in St. Paul and you're under peak controlled tariff, that means that on those super warm summer days, Excel can say, hey, Lindstrom Manufacturing Company, you are under a peak controlled tariff, therefore you must dial back your energy usage to this agreed upon amount um, on this hot day. The category. It's kind of, yeah, exactly. categories um, for what you pay. Schedule, schedule of fees. It's often yep. called your utility rate structure. So you've maybe got a peak demand rate structure and fix the number of rate structures. Residential, small business. Can people on the web, web uh, can people on the web hear Pete? Yes, pretty well usually. Speak loud so the folks on the on the web uh, can hear you. One thing that you want to make sure you consider is that any energy generated 
will get offset with peak uh, demand rate, or is it simply your quantity of demand rate? So you have to look at what you're careful in estimating the savings of it. Who's working with somebody that is knowledgeable on the price structure and all that? Does storage fit into this RFP? When you think about solar and storage together? Storage, it certainly could. Yep, I mean, it's not in the model RFP, but if you're a city that's interested in storage, absolutely you can build it in. Any other questions? How about behind the meter as opposed to fully grid inner tides? Does the RFP address? It does address that. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. And last slide. Cool. Thanks, Pete. Uh, thanks, Alexis. Thanks, Brian. Becky took off. Uh, how about a hand for all of our. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to thank Siemens, our workshop uh, sponsor, um, for supporting uh, each of these workshops that we have. Next month, uh, all you Metro folks kind of get a break, I think. Um, we're going to take a trip to St. Cloud. So we haven't done this before, but we're taking the workshop on the road. Um, we're going to go to St. Uh, Cloud and check out their wastewater treatment plant. And so for those of you on the webinar, if you're in greater Minnesota, your community has um, a wastewater treatment facility, this workshop is for you. Um, all you Lucky Ducks get the Met Council, so um, you can uh, take. December off and uh, January we'll be discussing EVs. Uh, it'll be really important for those city folks because we're really going to focus on um, city fleets and um, what cities can do to start thinking about how they can integrate EVs into their normal fleet um, schedule. So uh, I think that's, that's it for now. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to these students. I hope that uh, you learned a bunch of stuff and you can take it back to your class. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you came and if there are future workshops, feel free to either come or tune into the webinar. So thanks everyone and see you in January. Cool, so it's all coming together for this class? It is, yeah. Oh, so can we get a little tour? Yeah. Oh, I'm totally coming. Yeah, yeah. That's really fun.